Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you, Brian. So Brian asked me to reprise my talk because in many ways, as he's mentioned, Isolated hepatitis B core antibody in people with HIV is vexing and perplexing topic for many clinicians. This is an update on the one I gave several years ago. So I have no disclosures. So these are some of the key points I want to cover today. We'll walk through some virology and definitions, talk about the scenarios that lead to the serologic profile, and go over the clinical implications, what they might be, especially with respect to occult hepatitis B and hep B immunization. So hepatitis B is a partially double-stranded DNA virus, and the hepatitis B surface antigen is a lipoprotein that's part of the envelope, as shown here, and that contains the major site for binding of neutralizing antibodies. So the surface antigen can circulate as part of the virion or independently as viral particles. It is the hallmark of chronic infection. There are two nucleocapsid proteins, so th this is represented as sort of these red beads here, the E antigen and the core antigen. And so in contrast to antibodies to surface antigen, antibodies to these elements do not confer lasting immunity. They basically tell us patient has been exposed to the virus. So this is the serologic pattern that evolves during acute infection that goes on to resolution. And you can see these three paralleling lines here represent these three antibodies. And they're the three main ones that we measure for hepatitis B. The core antibody, shown here in pink, the E antibody, and then showing up last in gold is the hepatitis B surface antibody. So you can see here that the total core antibody shows up relatively early in infection and remains present at relatively stable levels even long past the initial infection. Hep B core antibody may be seen either in acute or chronic infection and generally persists for life after immunity is developed in the case of resolved infection or if the patient goes on to chronic infection. I want to emphasize this fact because I think clinicians tend to confuse core antibody with core antigen which we can't measure. We can't measure core antigen. We can only measure the antibody. So the presence of the core antibody does not in itself distinguish between active or resolved infection. It simply reflects the fact that the individual has seen the actual virus at some point in their lives. So an immunized individual or an individual who has never been exposed to natural infection would not have core antibody. So what is the definition of an isolated core profile? So when we send a standard hepatitis B panel, what we're measuring is the hepatitis B surface antigen, the surface antibody, and the core antibody. And so an isolated core profile is exactly that. It's just that the core antibody is positive, while the surface antigen and the surface antibody are negative. And it's a common profile found in about 20 to 45% of persons with HIV. And the factors that are associated with this profile uh, appear to be chronic hepatitis C co-infection, older age, CD4 count less than 100, so advanced immunosuppression, and then individuals who have HIV suppression on ART appear to be less likely to have an isolated core profile. So this profile emerges from one of four scenarios. So the first being the window phase, which is the period of time early in infection when the surface antigen has basically gotten down below detectable levels, and the surface antibody has not yet quite shown itself. And it is in this seronegative window where you can sometimes just get an isolated core antibody. Keep in mind that you will not encounter this very often as clinicians. It's such a short, discrete, and transient phase. And generally, there will be other clinically apparent manifestations of acute hepatitis B. So it's just sort of a thing of interest, but not something that we will encounter or see very much of. The second scenario is when you have someone who has seen hepatitis B and they've gone on to resolve their infection, but they basically have had waning of their surface antibody to a level that is less than 10 to 12 international units per liter, which depending on the assay is the threshold we consider protective. The third scenario is chronic infection. Basically, chronic infection can manifest as an isolated core when the surface antigen has waned over time due to low production, and we can sometimes see this 
in a chronic carrier, if they started to gain some better immune control and therefore lose their surface antigen production, or they have developed mutations to the surface antigen protein that escape detection by our standard assays. And finally, you could potentially get this as a false positive, and in fact, the patient may never have actually been exposed to hepatitis B. I'm going to focus on scenario two because realistically, the literature really suggests that when we see patients with isolated core, most of them are probably coming to us from scenario two, which is resolved infection with waned surface antibody. And the data for that really at least in the HIV world, comes from the multicenter AIDS cohort study, the MAX cohort, which evaluated 2,286 men who have sex with men, half of whom had HIV, all of whom had an isolated core profile and followed them for four years. And it turns out that in those who retested, the isolated core antibody appeared to be a pretty stable pattern over time, which suggested that the false positivity theory scenario four seems unlikely, especially in a group of MSM. If it changed at all, the transition was to and from a pattern of natural immunity. So essentially, what you'd see is an isolated core, and then you'd see the surface antigen, sorry, surface antibody pop up positive, and you might revert back. Transition to and from chronic infection with the gain or loss of surface antigen was actually rare. The other notable thing is that the isolated core profile in itself did not appear to be associated with ALT or AST elevations or other markers of advanced disease, such as elevated liver stiffness by fiber scan. In, in many of these case series, if there was not chronic hepatitis C also in the picture. So let's talk a bit, you know, because the fact of the matter is that in the absence of a surface antibody, we do worry about two possibilities, the possibility of hep B susceptibility and the possibility of chronic infection. So let's go through what we know about scenario three or occult hepatitis B. So cold hepatitis B, you know, most of these folks will have an isolated core profile, but it's by definition the absence of surface antigen, but a detectable HBV DNA level. And there's quite a bit, if you look at the literature, the, the prevalence of this in people with HIV is, is quite variable. And I think a lot of this depends on geography for the case series. So what population you're looking at, what assays there might have been used but if you look at the U.S.-based case series, the prevalence appears to be low on the, on the range of about 2% to 10% among isolated core patients. I will note that the true prevalence may not be known in many ways because, and it may be an underestimate due to the cross-sectional nature of many of these studies. They really just assess for this in one snapshot in time rather than looking at things longitudinally. And the fact of the matter is that many of our patients are on HPV-active antivirals, which will reduce our ability to detect occult hepatitis B. When the patient wasn't, weren't on these antivirals and they found occult hepatitis B, the, the viral levels detected were typically in the low range, less than 1,000 IU per mil. I think the bottom line is the clinical significance and true extent of occult hep B is not clear based on the literature. But the answer to the question, how worried should I be for occult hepatitis B in isolated core patients, is generally going to be, don't worry. But looked at it a different way, how aggressively should I hunt for this will depend a great deal on two things. One, where is the patient coming from? So I, I might be more inclined to be worried about this if the patient is coming from the Pacific Islands or was born in an Asian country, or is coming from East Africa, you know, so patients who are coming from HBD endemic areas. And then the second point is, what is at stake clinically? I tend to be more aggressive about hunting or watching for a coltepi when the clinical stakes are high. This is one example of high clinical stakes. So there have been reports of severe HBB reactivation in the setting of hep C treatment which was not something that any of us anticipated. We certainly didn't see it in the interferon era, probably because interferon has activity against hepatitis B. But this was a report of a 54-year-old woman with HIV whose CD4 count was in about 280, suppressed on an NRTI sparing regimen. She had CKD, and she had chronic hepatitis C. She did not have an isolated core profile, but was close. Her core antibody was positive. Her surface antibody level was only 12 and four weeks into cefosifir levdiposphere, she presented with nausea, malaise, 
ALT, AST in the 400 range, and her T Billy was 7. Her surface antigen during this flare turned positive, and her HBV DNA level was in the 6 log range. She was eventually started on Tecavir with a good resolution of her, her flare. And to understand why this can happen, you have to appreciate the phenomenon of viral interplay between hep C and hepatitis B. Hep C exerts an inhibitory effect on hep B, as evidenced by studies finding lower HBV viral levels in co-infection when compared with HBV mono-infected individuals. So when you take HCV out of the equation, as you do when you're using DAAs, HBV has the potential to come back in a fulminant way. The other high-stakes situation is where HPV reactivation can occur is when you give rituximab, which, as many of you know, is a favorite part of lymphoma treatment. It's a CD20 monoclonal antibody, and it turns out when you disable B-cell lymphocyte activity in the way that you do with rituximab, you open the door to severe HPV reactivation, and this has been reported to occur even in patients with isolated core antibody. So I wanted to do a quick poll question. So this is a 50-year-old man on antiretroviral therapy, CD4, 678, suppressed, and he's got an isolated core profile, liver function tests are fine. What would you do next? So please submit your answers. Don't be shy. For the sake of time, maybe I'll have Adrian show the results. Okay, great. So it seems like there is a plurality between uh, choice A, which is to look for a cult B, and C, which is just to give a standard dose and check the surface antibody titer. It turns out the guidelines suggest you should do C, and I'll go into that in a little more detail. So immunization can presumably help you distinguish between the three more common scenarios for isolated core. So if your isolated core represents resolved infection with Wayne's surface antibody, you should theoretically be able to mount an anamnestic response. The idea is that the host has an immunologic memory of the infection and if exposed to the viral antigen, the seroprotective response should come roaring back, if you will, because it is not the first time it has seen this. The big but, though, is that in isolated core patients with HIV, they often don't mount this anamnestic response. And this is in sharp contrast to those who do not have HIV. Isolated core antibody patients with HIV behave in fact, as though they've never seen the viral antigen before. And it speaks, I think, to their Im impaired immune responses, which implies that they may indeed be susceptible to HPV and in need of a full vaccine series. So I discussed this a bit in my December 2020 ECHO talk on HPV immunity. So as you can see in this table, this is a table of studies where they basically try to immunize, give a dose to patients with HIV and isolated core profile. And you could see that the rate of anamnestic response was as low as 7% to about 30%. And some of this variability may be due to the imprecision you get when you have a small sample, but also differences in clinical features of these patients and how the authors defined anamnestic response. Let's focus on the larger and more recent of these studies by Puroth. So this was a prospective study that enrolled 54 individuals with HIV and isolated core antibody, nearly all on ART. And in their protocol, they chose to give a standard 20 microgram dose of recombinant vaccine and then measured the surface antibody four weeks later. 46% did mount a response to greater than 10, but only 8 had mounted what they defined as an anamnestic response, which is getting the surface antibody above 100 the other notable thing about these individuals, these anamnestic responders, was that when they were followed out to month eight, they all maintained a protective surface antibody titer of greater than 10, compared with only 23% of the others who hadn't gotten above 100. So for those who did not respond at all, they went ahead and gave a series of three double doses with good responses shown here. So what do the guidelines say with respect to isolated core patients with HIV? They actually say you should not routinely check for HBV DNA levels in patients with isolated core, probably because of some of the data that I showed you. And they said that we should vaccinate them first by giving a standard dose, checking a surface antibody titer, and then if they don't mount an anonymous response, which they define here as greater than 100 IU per liter or greater, then they should give a full vaccine series. They don't actually say 
what that full vaccine series should look like, which I thought was interesting. The HIV MA guidelines pretty much say these folks should just receive vaccination and they don't give specifics. The other interesting thing that I think these guidelines don't say is what to do in instances when we happen to see isolated core antibody develop from waning surface antibody, which we talk about in the December 2020 talk, which I think the implication here is that we would not routinely be monitoring for waning surface antibody, which is certainly, as we know, a well-known phenomenon, as I've discussed in my December talk. So I will leave you with some additional advice that comes mainly from me (laughs) as an expert based on what we know. So in general, we shouldn't routinely screen for occult hepatitis B, but the situations where I think about screening would be in a patient who is not on HPV active ART, and let's say their ALT and AST is elevated, and you don't know why. That's when you need to check. I would definitely think about checking in someone who has chronic hepatitis C, especially pre-DAA in anticipation of DAA therapy. And then if you see a person just not responding to HPV vaccination, like they're not bumping their titer at all, that's when I would think about this. And then, of course, any other scenario where you're worried about HPV reactivation. Let's say you're, you've got an African-born patient and you're thinking about they're an isolated core and you're thinking about withdrawing, <laughs> changing them to a nuke sparing regimen, for example, you know, that kind of thing. And then, of course, all the good standard principles of immunization apply here as well, which is to vaccinate early in care, always to check an anti-HBS titer one to two months after vaccination, and then stay tuned for the potential role for the CPG adjuvanted hep B vaccine. The Beehive ACTG trial that I mentioned earlier in my December talk are actually not enrolling patients who have core antibody but their results will no doubt inform how we vaccinate these patients. So yeah, with that, I will open up for questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.